Cool. Well, thank you very much, Dave, and thank you all for, for coming this morning. And I'd like to start by thanking all of the people and institutions who've helped out with this rather collaborative effort on the late Devonian. So to follow the theme of starting with a follow the theme of starting with a uh, a Ralph and uh, graph. Um, here are a list of, uh, of some slash all of the uh, major environmental perturbations and anoxic events, ocean acidifications, and indeed mass extinctions uh, through the Phanerozoic, the last 500 of million years, with the big five marked in these red arrows. So we start with the end or the Vician, probably caused by glaciations, uh, and then the late Devonian marks the second of these big five extinctions before the, the three better known ones from the Permian onwards. And the Devonian is quite a, an interesting time in, in Earth's history. Um, there's a lot of tectonics going on. You've got some major rifting happening, some Eobariscan orogenies happening eventually up here, um, heralding the beginning of the formation of Pangaea. Um, you have the first uh, tetrapod on land. You have the major first forests, courtesy of vascular rooted systems. Um, fish are at their most diverse. Reefs are at their most diverse for much of this period, getting quite high latitudes. And although the period is quite warm generally, um, by the end you're starting to go into cooling that heralds the beginning of the, the late Paleozoic ice house that will dominate the Carboniferous and Permian stages. And superimposed upon all of this, there is a few biological crises as well. Um, so here are a few more ev bits of evidence for these long-term processes. So sea level uh, is going up throughout the mid to late Devonian. Um, oxygen isotope data suggests that you've got warming through much of the mid to late Devonian, and then you start going into the cooling at the end. Uh, weathering rates seem to be going up for much of the mid to late Devonian in, in general, marked by strontium isotopes. And then quite a few carbon cycle perturbations as well, as indicated by the carbon isotope compositions of sedimentary uh, records. And then some of the, these are not all of them, but some of the bigger um, biologic crises of the second half of the Devonian are indicated here as well. And this is one thing which is odd about the Devonian mass extinction. It's not just one big bang like the, uh, the end Cretaceous might have been. There are a lot of biological events um, coming in throughout. But these are the big ones uh, of, the, of the late Devonian, the, the Kelwasser events. So named for these records in Germany, um, where I'm not sure how well you can see this, but you have black shales uh, marked on this lithological column here, suddenly outcropping in otherwise quite oxic limestone records. Um, and these black shales uh, also coincide with organic uh, matter increases and carbon isotope positive excursions, which suggest a lot of organic matter burial happening during these two episodes called the upper and the lower Kelvasser events. And most of the extinctions happen with the upper Kelvasser events, so both pelagic <coughs> and um, benthic life forms, and in particular the reef systems, having been so diverse and widespread for much of the Devonian, suddenly go splat. Um, and for anyone who's worked on some of the Mesozoic OEEs, um, if you've been to this rather famous place in Italy, the Furlow Quarry, superficially the Devonian looks quite a bit like this in Europe. You go from lovely, cream, pristine limestones to thick black shales. So is this a bit like a glorified Mesozoic OAE? We'll come back to that. Um, but certainly, because of the drawdown of anoxia, uh, the drawdown of organic matter, rather, that suggests that a lot of anoxia is probably happening in the marine realm, at least in Europe. Um, so that seems to be involved with the extinction. Other things that we've got evidence for at this time are lots of global cooling um, and also some uh, increased weathering rates. Multiple ideas for what might be causing that, whether by erosion of the newly forming Eobariscan orogeny or these widespread developing forests um, with their new root systems uh, starting to break apart uh, uh, rocks more physically, or both. Uh, but the idea is these nutrients then feed into the ocean, triggering the anoxia and also uh, the global cooling. But you still want a smoking gun, something to start all this off. So ideas, well, the classic two, uh, the impacts and the volcanics. Uh, at least two big impact craters, uh, or big-ish, known from the late Devonian, um, possibly more, uh, have been hypothesized, and also large igneous province volcanism. There's some good evidence for that in the late Devonian, and because of the big correlation with large igneous provinces and Mesozoic events, this is a, a, a good idea as well for the Devonian maybe too. So uh, what are we looking into for my postdoc in Lausanne? Um, 
first off, when did this extinction happen? Let's get that pinned down quite nicely. Um, but also then to do some geochemistry uh, on these records and, and also use the dates to see what can we correlate this extinction, the, the Kelbasser extinction, the big one of the Devonian, with, uh, and what might that tell us about the causes? And we've been looking at records from Poland, uh, Germany, France, and Australia. So first up, when did this event happen? And the, the current time scale, uh, geological time scale, defines the franian fermenian boundary as 372.2 plus or minus one and a bit million years ago, which sounds fairly precise for 400 million years ago. Um, but when you're comparing it to uh, large impacts or large-scale volcanism, which impact the Earth on tens of thousands of years, you really want to be getting a bit more precise if you can, and people have been doing that for the later mass extinctions in recent years. Sam, Sam Bowring, uh, Seth Burgess, and Blair Schoner, amongst others. Um, so we went back to Steinbrook Schmidt, where there is a lovely bentonite between the two Kelbasser horizons, so very close to the Franian fermenian boundary and the extinction. Um, ideal for this sort of thing, for telling us how old the extinction is. Uh, we are not the first to have had this idea, funnily enough. Um, 15 years ago or so, Bernard Kaufman also <coughs> dated this bentonite and got an age of 377.2, plus or minus a couple of million years. Still fairly imprecise and also inconsistent with the ages which have come out via other methods more recently. So we went back there last year and resampled it, and if we can use the, the more up-to-date Earth time methods uh, in Geneva to get a, a more precise and or accurate date. Sadly, I don't have any pretty pictures of zircons to show you. Uh, the zircons were beautiful, though. They were re gave really good, nice uh, ages. Um, and even when we removed the older ages, which is something that you, you generally have to do when dealing with zircon ages, uh, because they form, they crystallise in the magma chamber, so the actual age of the eruption will give you, uh, is given by the age of the youngest zircons you analyse, typically. Um, so even when we do that, even the oldest zircons are still pretty close, and the, the youngest zircons give us an age of 372.36 million years, plus or minus 50,000, so much, much more precise than anything we've had before. Um, giving a franian fermanian boundary age of around 372 million years ago, uh, within a, a couple of hundred thousand years of that, certainly. Much more precise than anything we've had before. But, interestingly, rather younger than the Silian impact crater, which is the classically the one best thought to be uh, involved with this extinction, and also younger than any large igneous province basalts that we've got from the late Devonian. Now, it is worth pointing out that these are all argon-argon ages. This is a uranium lead age, and there might be some calibration issues there. Uh, but certainly, this isn't directly supportive of, uh, of volcanism or, or really impacts. But there might be sampling bias, there might be calibration errors. And really, what we need at this point is more precise dates and more dates full stop of more villitrite basalts. Have we just not found the ones that precisely coincided with the extinction yet? Um, alongside some sedimentary proxies for volcanism, if we look at the extinction horizons themselves, do we uh, see traces of volcanism there? Or anything else for that matter? Um, so we've gone and had a look at some osmium isotopes of these sediments. Um, these uh, can give you, tell you about both weathering and volcanism, uh, because the continental crust has a very radiogenic osmium isotope signature. The uh, primitive mantle has much more unradiogenic, very low <coughs> osmium-187 to 188 ratios uh, compared to very high here. So if you take a sediment and you see very high um, 187 to 188 ratios, that tells you lots of weathering, very low ratios, lots of volcanism in theory. Um, so we went to the Koala Quarry in Poland where you have most of the Fermenian and the Franian recorded. Uh, and for the lower Kelbasa, first of all, we see a very high, uh, very high ratios, uh, suggesting lots of weathering, and then it plunges down to much lower ratios, suggesting lots of volcanism. For the upper Kelvassar, on the other hand, very little change. Well, this is a bit bizarre. We've got what looks like evidence for both weathering and volcanism during the lower Kelvassar, but nothing really going on during the upper Kelvassar. Is that because there was nothing happening? Or is it because uh, there was, but they cancel out? Or is it because this record isn't actually representative of what's going on on the world at this point? That last option we don't think is the case uh, because our background values from the Fermenian and the Franian 
uh, are all roughly in line with the late Devonian osmium isotope uh, average uh, from North America. So it does look like it's a valid record, um, but this may suggest that something very fundamentally different is happening during the upper Kelbasa event and the lower Kelbasa. Um, but to take it a bit further, we then started looking at some other proxies, and I don't have time to show you all of them. Um, but the significant one, uh, other one that we've done uh, for this talk, is to look at mercury. Now, mercury is a potential proxy for volcanism. In the modern, volcanoes emit mercury. It can get globally distributed and eventually drawn down, usually on organic matter. Uh, so when we look at it in sediments, we look at both the concentrations absolute and also this Hg over uh, total organic carbon ratio to account for the fact that it's organic matter drawdown. And what the mercury shows in, in Poland is a big spike in the upper Kelwasser, and also when you normalize it, but nothing so impressive with the lower Kelwasser, rather weirdly. So the osmium and the mercury seem to be telling us different messages. This is, of course, just one record. Um, what, what do other records show? We did try osmium isotopes for, for Steinbrück Schmidt in Germany as well. Unfortunately, that section seems to have been somewhat baked in the last 350 million years. Um, the osmium isotopes uh, came out crazy values and basically meaningless. Um, the mercury we had a bit more success with, so here is the German section again, uh, equivalent here. Um, we did see some nice peaks in mercury and in mercury over TOC. But again, this section has been baked. The TOC values are probably quite a bit lower than they were originally at the time of deposition. So how much do we trust this ratio? Was it much lower originally? Uh, in Kumiak, in France, we do see some spikes in mercury at the upper and lower Kelvassers, and that looks fine, um, although the values are astonishingly high for mercury and carbonates. You don't normally have those high values. A bit weird. Uh, and in the Cunning Basin carbonates, we have very, very low mercury values and no real perturbations. So maybe there is a whiff of volcanism here in the osmium and possibly the mercury, but it's not at all certain yet. So to sum up, um, we have a, a new date for the franian fermenian extinction. This will hopefully allow better correlation with impacts, volcanics, whatever. Um, it doesn't directly support any of those, but that might be sampling bias or dates we don't have yet. The osmium isotopes do suggest volcanism and weathering during the lower Kelbasa at least, not necessarily the upper, but uh, those events might be fundamentally different. But an important point, if it was volcanism involved here, the, Meso the Mesozoic model of lots of warming, anoxia, extinction, etc., doesn't really hold for the Devonian. The Kelwasser events are cooling events, so we need to come up with a new mechanism. Um, and with so many long-term and short-term processes going on in the late Devonian, could it just be lots of things destabilizing the climate until something fairly nondescript breaks the Campbell's back? Hopefully, there will be more of this at EGU if you're going to Vienna in a month's time uh, on Tuesday morning. Fingers crossed. Um, thank you very much for listening today, though. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, we have time for one question. Okay. Can intrusives at all affect... Can intrusives at all affect the mercury record, or does it all have to be extrusive? Um, it, I think the, it probably depends on what you're intruding. Um, if you are intruding something nice and thick like some black shales because they tend to, or coals because they might have lots of mercury in them, then that might indeed, uh, uh, in the, after the Svensson, the Henrik Svensson model of, of thermogenics, you might then produce some, some mercury output. Um, but I suspect it very much depends on what you're intruding, and I don't believe that the villoy traps, insofar as we know, do intrude uh, organics. Um, I believe they, they might intrude carbonates or something, but um, that's, I think, it's, it's all done by boreholes, so it's not entirely, entirely clear. But maybe. Uh, we'll take one more of these. One short question. Just behind you, Alex. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, the bentonite layer, um, just thinking back to the division and the kind of idea of a large kind of... Uh, ash eruptions causing global cooling? Is that maybe a possibility for the upper Kilvasa, maybe? Um, so the, the, I mean, the, the bentonite layer I showed is probably just a local eruption, nothing to do with anything large scale. 
In terms of sort of the grand scheme picture of causing global cooling, um, yes, ash could do that, and even more potently on a short time scale, at least sulfur dioxide emissions. If you have lots of continuous eruptions, and they would have to be continuous because sulfur dioxide doesn't have a very long residence time in the atmosphere, then you could achieve some global cooling that way. That's fine, that gets you the global cooling, but how does it account for the weathering and the anoxia? You've got to pull some clever trickery because in theory, cooling should counter uh, global scale weathering um, and it shouldn't necessarily stimulate anoxia. So it's, it's, it's not as easy as, as the standard Mesozoic model of you get warming that stagnates the oceans and stimulates weathering which stagnates them further. It's, it's a tricky one to, to unravel.